Welcome to Decoding Superhuman. This show is a deep dive into obsessions with health, performance, and how to elevate the human experience. I explore the latest tools, science, and technology with experts in various fields of human optimization. This is your host, Boomer Boomer Anderson. Anderson. Enjoy the journey. Today on the Decoding Superhuman podcast, we are talking protecting the asset, how many projects can you really handle, and essentialism with New York Times bestselling author, Greg McEwen. Greg McEwen has dedicated his career to discovering why some people and teams break through to the next level and others, frankly, don't. His work is summed up in the book, Essentialism, The Disciplined Pursuit of Less. It's a New York Times bestselling book, as well as a Wall Street Journal bestseller. And McEwen is the CEO of McEwen Inc. His clients include, and this is a pretty impressive list, Adobe, Apple, Google, Facebook, Pixar, Salesforce, Twitter, and basically all of Silicon Valley. His writing has appeared in places like the New York Times, Fast Company, the Harvard Business Review, Fortune, Huffington Post, Political, and many others. What did we get into on the show? Well, let's start with a confession. At this point, or at least when this was recorded, I was pursuing way too many projects, all within this framework of elevating the human experience through health. I thought I was doing quite well, but in fact, I was pushing things along at really a micro pace, and this conversation could not be more timely in my life. We talk about how to select projects, what it means to actually protect the asset, the value of sleep, white noise machines, how to say no to people, and a lot more. Perhaps one of my favorite conversations on the Decoding Superhuman podcast, and that's because, well... It was essential in my life to have at the time. You can find all the show notes for this one at decodingsuperhuman.com slash essentialism. When I think of images that capture the word essentialism, the first thing that comes to mind for me is a carry-on bag. Because whatever you put in there is absolutely essential to your life. Now, when airports open up again and I begin traveling all around the world, the essential workout equipment that will be in my bag is the Be Strong blood flow restriction device. I've been fascinated by blood flow restriction training for a very long time. And the guys at Be Strong did some really cool innovations on the technology. I use it just about every day high reps, low number of sets, a few exercises. And in 20 minutes, I have a fantastic workout, which I know is triggering an anabolic response. And who doesn't like that, right? So if you want to get your Be Strong blood flow restriction device, head on over to Go Be Strong, that's G-O-B, as in the letter B, strong.com, and use the code BOOMER, and you're gonna get yourself a nice little discount. All right, shout out to Triplet Tom, who left this five-star review. And it's long, so I'm going to take pieces of it. But Triplet Tom, my heart goes out to you, man. This was amazing. I've been listening to Boomer Anderson ask very probing questions to the guests in Decoding Superhuman for about a year. It is time well spent and always provides some knowledge, some pearl of a great price. And that helps me towards being a superhuman as best as possible. Triplet Tom, thank you for the review. If this podcast grabs you in a good way, I would encourage you to head on over to Apple Podcasts, as it's called now, or wherever you listen to podcasts, and leave a five-star review. Who knows? Maybe I'll read yours off in the future, but also, I just love reading them. So thank you, guys, and let's move on with the show. Greg, welcome to the show. It's great to be with you. Today, and you you and I were discussing this beforehand, This conversation couldn't come at a better time in my life. And I think there's a number of people listening to this that will will benefit. But perhaps attacking the essentialism right off the bat, how does an essentialist view social media? 
uh, as a really powerful tool uh, that you don't that you want to be able to use but not be used by. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you know, I, I would say social media makes a good servant but a poor master. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Uh, before we go into so many questions that I have that I alluded to, I think it's worth defining essentialism. And in some ways, I've had people in the audience, when I polled the audience, ask, you know, this, the question of essentialism versus minimalism, because minimalism is very much the rage among the hipsters these days. Uh, but how do they differ? And if you don't mind just defining essentialism in the process. Essentialism is mindset is a way of looking at everything that you do, everything that you could do through a single question, which is, is it essential? Uh, and you find if you do that, that not everything is. Uh, in fact, I would argue that like 90% of stuff isn't. Mm-hmm. Almost by definition, what is essential is 90% or above. So you're looking for those things that are very important, really important, uh, because there's always enough time for what's essential. Mm-hmm. There's never enough time for everything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you're looking for the things that are highly valuable, highly important, and then to try to reduce or entirely eliminate everything else. <laughs> and then to, to try to create a life that protects the things that matter most and maybe even make it easy to do what matters most so that you can do it without exhausting yourself, without burning yourself out. Uh, And you can continue to make a higher and higher contribution, uh, but in a way that's sustainable. Uh, Really, this is what essentialism is all about. Amazing. When you're, when you, and I know you've done some work with executives and companies around the world, (laughs) And this may resonate with, well, it resonates with me. When you see somebody who's completely overextended and has, you know, that Google calendar, which is just chock full of everything possible, involved in multiple companies, not sleeping very well, all of that stuff. I imagine the first thing that somebody says to you is, I don't have the time for that. How do you confront that, that question and helping somebody to create space? Well, I I remember, yeah, the the space to figure out what really matters. That's what you're saying, that they feel like they have have enough time to do that because they're so busy reacting, you know, to what they, to to all the non-essential stuff that's already coming at them. Um, Yeah, I mean, I remember working with an executive in Silicon Valley who was doing award-winning work in one organization because he was so focused and partially because of the success that he produced there, the, the success that followed that focus. Uh, he was working on it, what was a product that many, many people have, uh, have used and would recognize that that company got purchased by a larger, as it turns out, more bureaucratic company. So he goes to the new firm and, and at first he's really in the position that you're just describing where he feels obligated to do everything for everyone, you know, because he wants to be a good team player and he wants to, he doesn't want to, you know, have a reputation as somebody who's just difficult to work with. Mm -hmm. So uh, he, at first, is going to every meeting, he's on every email chain and, and his stress is just going up as the quality of his work is going down. And here is this top performer I mean, top talent, literally, we, you know, we can prove it. That's his record. Uh, and suddenly he's not. Mm-hmm. He's plateaued his progress. He's almost starting to burn out. And he began a thought experiment. And the thought experiment was, well, like, what's the very best use of me? It's the highest and best use of, of my time. And as soon as he started that, he thought, well, being invited to a meeting isn't sufficient reason for going to it. Mm -hmm. 
And it doesn't mean you start saying no to everyone and everything, but suddenly he was just holding up the, the criteria. Mm-hmm. He's using a new lens. And, and that's what I would recommend for a busy executive is to just, I'm, I'm not even saying transform everything at first. I'm not even saying take a week off and think about your life. And so, I mean, those things could be useful, mm-hmm. but I'm just saying hold up a new lens. Just question it. As you're going through your normal day, as you're going through your normal set of emails, your normal meetings, your calendar stuff, just hold up this question. Is it essential? Mm-hmm. Is this next thing essential? Uh, and so that you start to become aware of what is and what isn't. Uh, what happens to him is that he, um, he said he got his life back. That's his summary of the experiment. Uh, he, you know, he was able to eat dinner with his wife every night uninterrupted. He was able to go to the gym uh, every night um, when he hadn't been doing that before. At work, he said, I got space back on my calendar. In that, in that space, I found my creative freedom again mm-hmm. uh, to do something that, uh, that could be valuable. Uh, and he ended that year with one of the largest bonuses of his whole career. And his performance valuations went up. So it's an interesting value proposition that by doing fewer things better, he actually was able to make a higher contribution Mm -hmm. than if he was doing many, many things averagely well, uh, which doesn't actually keep everybody happy anyway. Mm -hmm. At what point does this magical word no come into play? Because as a person who has historically struggled with being a, a yes man in the sense that I always wanted to be looked on as like the, the keystone factor, the guy who can take the world on his shoulders, etc. I imagine that word no becomes very, very powerful at some point, but can you just do it right away? And how do you break that habit? Cause it's damn strong. Well, I think the first thing you have to do is you have to broaden your sense of, of, of options. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not just the polite yes or the rude no, which I think is the false dichotomy that many people are stuck with. Mm-hmm. If you think those are your only two options, then you are going to say yes more than no because you don't want the instant negativity that can come back from a rude no, right? Like that gets beaten out of you. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you, so you just, you end up with what feels like one option in life, right? You get the polite yes, that's it. So you're going to say yes to more than you can possibly do. And, and, and it's that constraint, by the way, that makes it so vital that we get out of the yes trap, yes to everything trap. Mm-hmm. Because you cannot possibly do it all. So I didn't make up that problem. You know, I'm sorry that the, the world is designed, you know, is that way. Nice if we never had to choose not to do something, but you can't choose that. Mm-hmm. So now the question is, is how do you go through a world where you can't do everything? And it means that you've got to learn to negotiate. Mm-hmm. You've got to negotiate essentials. You've got to do it as positively as possible. It's to go to, it's to, go to the manager and to say, look, let's talk about what the most important essential things are that, I, that we can work on. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the things that we think would create value. And then maybe let's talk about the things that are sort of necessary to do to keep the lights on. And let's talk about what the ratio should be between those two. Mm-hmm. So now you're having a conversation, a negotiation that is positive in nature. And everybody is incentivized to participate in that because you don't want, no no manager wants their people working 100% of the time Mm -hmm. on the stuff that just is keeping the lights on. They want to have a percentage of their time doing the value add stuff, doing the things that can take you forward. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so so I think it's really about uh, a negotiation uh, so that you can make sure you are working on the right things, not just more things. I love that. It resonates very, very well. When you get to this space, and I, in preparation for this interview, I've tried to create more space and sort of looking at my own existing obligations. 
you do have existing obligations. And then you look at them and you say like, shit, that's not essential. Um, or that doesn't really, that doesn't grab me in a good way. Uh, do you just tell people to break their existing obligations or, or how do you, it, it doesn't seem to me as an easy answer. Like, how do you get through that? Should I just roll up my sleeves, get these existing obligations done and then be a little bit smarter in the future? Or how do you deal with that in an executive sense? What's an example of something that you've looked at and got? Uh, that could be, so by way of background, I have uh, my hands in a couple of different startups and I predominantly, I love strategy, business strategy. There are certain things that in startups that you don't like to do, because as you say, keeping the lights on is important. You have a burn rate and you still need to do those things. Uh, so that could be anything from uh, sending emails to certain suppliers to, you know, quality control, for instance, in certain instances, uh, like doing quality control of a product. Um, how would you look at that? Yeah, the, you know, I'm, I'm pushing for the specifics because that, the, the, you know, the specifics, the clarity is what helps us to, I think, evaluate how best to go forward. Mm -hmm. In the example you gave, part of me senses you probably don't want to get into all you this, can if you want since, well part of what you're saying i i sensed in your body language a feeling of like yeah i have probably you know i got these two different stances a couple of different stances what, what that said to me was oh i've got quite a lot going on underneath the, de the desk you know like underneath here up here smooth you know down there there's there's quite a lot packed into that down there mm -hmm. and and maybe too much is packed into there yeah and so if too much is packed into there, then it's not just a, oh, should I, should I do this um, task today or not? Mm -hmm. It's a strategic decision, a strategic trade-off where you actually look at all the stuff that's stuffed down there that we're sort of trying to keep at bay. And we actually say, well, what if we didn't do all of these things? What if we did say, um, uh, you know that this this no longer meets this is no longer meeting the need that it once did this is no longer something that is worthy of my investment mm -hmm. uh, and at least having that again discussion and negotiation not just saying oh i said yes once time in the past therefore i've got to say yes every single day forever mm -hmm. uh, and so that's that's what's got me curious about your question. It's, I mean, your your counterpoint is a very valid one, right? Like, there's a lot of stuff below the surface, and it, it does beg the question: like, maybe there's too many plates up here. Um, in terms of how do you maybe shoot one of the not shoot? Uh, how do you back away from one of the plates entirely? Shoot the plate is all right. We'll go with that. <laughs> how can we how can we remove this? I mean, you're right, because it's a sort of inherently violent idea. Is there a gentle way to say no, mm -hmm. which there is? Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that a gentle, a gentle no, a polite no, even a negotiated no, does not mean everybody will be happy. Of course. But saying yes to everyone and everything doesn't produce an end state where everybody is happy either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a false thing to, to go, well, I don't want to, negotiate out of this team and off this program and out of that commitment because someone might not like it. Yeah, well, people aren't going to like you when you're burned out. It's a very, very true point. People aren't going to like it when we half commit to things and fulfill, you know, in this, in this sort of uh, very absent form of commitment either, mm -hmm. where we say we do it, but really our heart's not in it. So, so we can remove the idea of, okay, keeping everybody happy. That's just a big con. We're not doing that. Mm -hmm. And instead, come back to this idea, what's the, most, what's the most important thing we can work on? Let me give you an example about this, if I can find it. Um, somebody laminated this for me recently. This is, um, this is a note that I had in my pocket one time, and I was sharing it with someone, and they said, they literally took it, and they said, I'm going to go laminate this right, right now. It's a note from my daughter. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I'd been trying to persuade her to uh, to read a book on this day. Mm-hmm. She loves to read constantly. And then, but she didn't want to do this. She was pushing back. No big argument, but she slipped this note under my office when I was in my next meeting. I just want to read it to you. She's 14 when she wrote mm-hmm. this. I already expressed my unwillingness to read this book, but I'm willing to make a counter offer. I am not willing to read it all in one day today, but I'd be happy to explore the possibility of reading it in the future over the course of a few weeks. I believe it would be best to wait till the end of my literature assignment. If you would like me to read this book in place of a separate assignment and over the course of a few weeks, I'm sure that can be made possible. <laughs> wow, your daughter's 14 when she wrote that? Yeah, she was. And, and I, I just think that illustrates, you know, maybe better than anything else I could say about, about the importance of being able to negotiate this, to be able to have this conversation, mm-hmm. to be able to uh, have the, the courage and the, and the compassion to be able to explore what's the right way forward. Mm-hmm. And, and if you can't, if you can't have that conversation, if you can't, then, then you should at least admit where you are in a relationship. Mm-hmm. And that could be a comfort issue or, an, or comfortable with yourself, I guess, really. Yeah, it depends what it is, but it's, but it's uh, the, the, the psychological safety to be able to, to explore not doing something. Mm-hmm. Uh, my wife, this is a very first world problem example, but my wife, uh, Anna, is, has from when she was very young, wanted to have horses. And so she spent years, you know, like mucking out stables and re- barely getting to ride. But uh, it was always sort of one of the things that we wanted to do and what I wanted to make possible for her and for the children. And so we moved and we, uh, in order, into an area in order to be able to have horses, one of the several reasons. Uh, and we got them two horses and, and there's lots to applaud about that. Mm-hmm. But over time certainly for Anna, but she was the one that was putting in the energy, the, the cost-benefit analysis seemed to be such that, like, you know what, the joy that I was hoping to receive from this is, is, is pretty minimal. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it was very hard to get out of it, partially because every time she would express this to me, I would say, oh, I think we can make it work, you know, because I'm trying to help fulfill this, you know, this decades-old pursuit. Mm-hmm. And really, I couldn't hear it mm-hmm. uh, properly. And I'm using this illustration because I think a lot of the things we go after uh, in life, we, we, we wanted them at some point. That's why we got to where we are. But then we have to keep updating, keep checking in and going, if I was starting now, would I do this? If, if I... You know, if I hadn't made this commitment years ago, would I still be pursuing this strategy? Mm-hmm. Um, as we've gone through rounds of discussion, counseling together, listening, asking questions, we concluded, no, it's not the right thing anymore. It served its purpose. It's, it's, it's perfectly okay to move on from this and to be able to move on smilingly, unapologetically. Uh, yes to it at one time, no to it now. Let that thing go. It's fulfilled its usefulness. And so, and so within a very short time after having got to that clarity, uh, you know, we just sold them. And we haven't regretted it a second since. It is, so, yeah, go ahead. Is this the idea of zero-based budgeting that you're talking about in the book? Yeah, zero-based budgeting is a, is a great synopsis of what we're talking about. There's sort of two ways to do budgeting in, in financial terms. One is... Uh, you, you say, well, what did we spend in the past? And you try to either up it a little bit or reduce it a little bit, depending on, on other budget functions uh, and realities. Uh, zero-based budgeting is everything's off the table every time. And you start at zero and you say, okay, what are we trying to achieve? And therefore, where should we put resources? Mm-hmm. That's true. It's a literal you know, way of doing financial budgeting uh, and financial controls, uh, but you can do it in your life as well. Mm -hmm. You start over again, you know, repeatedly. What would I start if I was starting now? 
So instead of trying to whittle away at things, or oh, one less thing here, one less thing there, you just start at zero. What would I bring into my life if I was starting again right now? Mm-hmm. And sometimes that can be surprising. What would be essential if we had to start right now? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Is there a danger in asking that question too frequently in that you may, let's say you have a, a couple of tasks that could be tied to a greater purpose, but in that moment, you're like, well, damn, this doesn't seem essential to me. Uh, <laughs> is there, for instance, social media coming back to that? Uh, cool. It doesn't seem like a very gratifying thing. You get sucked down some wormhole and all of a sudden you've spent three days looking at cat videos, right? Um, <laughs> hopefully that doesn't happen to anybody listening to this. But um, how do you, uh, I mean, how do you, how often is too often to revisit that question? Is there too often? To is this essential? Well, I understand you should be asking that with regards to you know certain obligations, but yeah, I guess it, can you ask that question too often and then dilute sort of what needs to be done in that moment? Um, well, I suppose maybe. I don't think I've reached that <laughs> number yet. Mm-hmm. Um, I think typically we we go in the other direction where we aren't asking it at all. Yeah. And so what we're doing is just proceeding. We're just going along with the flow of activity that happens to exist. We are in our email inbox and there's a flow of information and requests and uh, you know, tennis game there, I'll send it back to you and you send it back to me and we send it back to each other because we're trying to both get everything out of our inbox. And, you know, like that's the that's the going a long way. Uh, and the problem with that is that the most important things sometimes and even often never make it into the inbox, mm-hmm. never make it onto the to-do list. So I do think that uh, asking the question, look, is this essential? Uh, and, and having to wrestle with the answer a little bit, um, you know, why am I doing this? Because that's the next sort of natural question. Is this essential? I don't know. Why am I doing this? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm doing it because this helps me. I'm on social media because this helps me to run my business in this way. Yeah. Now you've got a criteria to evaluate your activity. Is there a better way of doing this? Is there an easier way to do this? Could I do it the way that, you know, the businesses manage social media mm-hmm. uh, use a social media management platform so that you're not actually scrolling through social media. You are uh, just putting carefully curating your messages that you want to put out into the world uh, and, you're, and you're sharing those. And every so often you're going in and responding to people's, comments but you're not living there Mm -hmm. just being pulled along bullied by the the existing flow of information and opinions and so on Mm -hmm. Uh, one thing you mentioned earlier or kind of hinted at and i would love to just hear with your experiences with all these people uh, particularly i'm guessing in the venture capital world but other places uh fear of missing out is a huge thing right now, I guess you can say. And so looking at the fear of missing out and maybe that reframe into the joy of missing out, do you have a set of criteria or does it require going back to one's purpose in order to develop uh, a strong enough shield to not suffer from FOMO? Yeah, I think that, I think that shield is one word and it's not a bad word for something that we, that we might need to do a, a strategy. But I think the way I tend to think about this is that it's like amplifying the, the sacred voice instead of listening to all of the scared voices out there. That's a phrase a friend of mine used, and I love that, the difference between sacred voice and scared voice. But, but what what you want is not to be doing things because everybody else is doing them. It's not to be p- f- following a strategy because everybody else or somebody else is doing it. Because if you do that, if you let FOMO be your default criteria for making decisions, 
in a heartbeat, you will be doing way too many different things. Mm -hmm. And there won't even be coherence between that strategy. I mean, a FOMO strategy is, is, is like the polar opposite to coherence. Uh, it's chaotic. It's noisy. It's everything. It's just trying to do everything that anyone's doing. Mm -hmm. Oh, that person is successful doing X. Oh, well, I'm going to try and do that. That person's doing and you're trying to follow all these different tactics and all these different... Well, yeah, it worked for them because they made different sets of trade-offs. Are you willing to make all of the trade-offs necessary to pursue that strategy? Then fine, then pursue that. But don't try to do everything that everyone's doing and pull it like a, a, a coherent strategy. Mm -hmm. Instead, get quiet. What is it that you feel pulled to do? I talking to Tim Ferriss recently. He made that distinction. For him, at least, the language that he doesn't want to be pursuing a mission. He wants to be pulled into a calling, mm -hmm. something that's calling him forward. I think that's pretty good language for the distinction. What are you feeling, you know, and I don't mean pulled by the crowd. I mean pulled within mm -hmm. uh, to, to pursue and let that be your guide and do the, the you know, do the necessary things to prioritize that. Because I really think that our highest priority is to protect that ability to prioritize. I, I love that line in the book. When I was going through it this morning again, it is that line probably is something I'm gonna if I were to get a tattoo, I would tattoo that. But that's <laughs> an essentialism <laughs> tattoo. There we go. Uh, <laughs> So that decision framework then, so when you're going through this and just giving people listening sort of an, uh, an operating framework, if you will, to evaluate that calling is very difficult for people to understand initially or even have or for some people. But what other steps in that decision framework do you have that are, well, I guess, essential to your decision making? One thing I think is very helpful is to think of your life in three parts, in sort of a concentric circles, um, the most important at the center and moving out. Uh, the, the, the center is to protect the asset. Mm -hmm. um, the, at the very red hot center of that circle of protecting the asset is this ability we just described, the, the ability to prioritize. So I think about that as a sort of navigational intelligence, a spiritual capacity, uh, that that uh, a wisdom center that you start to, uh, to to use to be able to make sure everything else is put in its correct perspective. Mm -hmm. So protect the asset is first. That includes physical uh, health, so sleeping, uh, you know, it's making that a priority. Uh, making that, um, uh, recognizing that that's an investment in your ability to make good use of tomorrow, mm -hmm. uh, make wise decisions there. So all of that's within protect the asset. Right now, of course, that, that would include things for mental health. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so there's so much, you know, the rise of anxiety is enormous. Um, uh, but, but there's all sorts of things we can do like, reading wisdom literature every day is my first thing every morning. Do you have um, a favorite there? Because I was looking at the list you gave, and uh, I mean, it reminded me a little bit of what I read in more at night, but do you have a favorite sort of wisdom literature that you go to? Yeah, I mean, you know, putting scripture aside, which really is the first thing I go to, um, you know, I think, that, I think that it just needs to be, needs to be classics, mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I mean, I could say something like Anna Karenina, uh, you, you know, or, um, or William Wilberforce's biography. I mean, these, these are, it, William Wilberforce's biography is when I just began. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, it's something that, so, so it's not a single source, but, uh, but these are, these are things that help raise you above the, all that noise that's coming in. Mm -hmm. I certainly think in terms of protecting the asset, that first circle, you, you want to be, you want to get your head out of the news. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I, I, you know, my undergraduate was in journalism. 
So I, you know, I that that hurts in a way to to say that. But so often, what is described as news now is really, you know, somebody tweeted about someone tweeting about someone tweeting about somebody. So so news has become so reactive. It's like um, gossip. So then we're prioritizing news to be able to make sure that we're useful in society and we're aware of what's going on, but we're not going to get it from this source. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not saying maybe go to zero, but, uh, but I, I, I think we could turn that way, way down right now. Mm -hmm. uh, news is full of very anxiety inducing, which I think has like zero bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, increasing anxiety when somebody's already anxious has zero use to mm -hmm. it. Um, so this is all within protect the asset. That's like circle one. Circle two is family and the relationships that matter most to you. So it's a small inner circle of people. And it's making sure two things. One, uh, that you can provide for them, uh, that you can, that, that you can, you know, be there for them in that way, but also that you maintain and build strong relationships. So it's, it's a secondary protect the asset actually, mm -hmm. because it's, it's protecting the, the culture and making sure that you're building reserves into that culture, positive culture. That's a priority that, that to me is where I've been investing as soon as I'm outside of, protecting my own asset, I'm investing in make, maintaining a positivity in my family culture, mm -hmm. gratitude, pouring that in, especially at this time, so that we're looking for what's going right, so that we aren't stumbling around and pulled into this neg these negative emotions that people even could be right now. And then the third circle, there's only three, is other, <laughs> like everything else. And here's, here's what... Here's what I'm saying about those three is that what I've observed is that otherwise really successful people, busy executives, can get the order exactly wrong. Mm -hmm. So they're doing, they're serving other projects first. Secondly, family relationships. And then finally, protecting the asset that is them. So that comes last. And so if you do it in that order, you will never have enough time. You, you will never feel satisfied at the end of the day. And eventually you can start losing that sense of excitement in the morning as well. Mm -hmm. But if you get the order right, life starts to, time feels like it starts to expand. It's okay. There's a, this is, I've, got, I've got plenty of time because I've put it in the correct order. Before I move on to my next question, one thing that I know will reson it resonates with me and then the audience as well, uh, the maintaining positivity in the family, are there any things that you've found recently, just given everything that's going on, right, that has been very, very helpful in maintaining positivity within your household? Let's look at essentialism in the health optimization world. When it comes to health optimization, we have choices between technologies, tools, testing, supplements, and so many other things. It leads to the paradox of choice as well as decision fatigue, which I guess are one and the same. When it comes to nootropics, few things actually pass the sniff test for me. So therefore, essentialism is actually quite easy in that category. Right now, my essential nootropic is blue canatine. It has four ingredients. Hemp crystals beautifully derived, caffeine, nicotine, as well as methylene blue. And the combination of those four, albeit in micro doses, leads to this amazing feeling that I can only describe as limitless. I'm locked in, able to get shit done, and my verbal fluency is top notch, which is essential for a podcast. If you want to get yours, head on over to troscriptions.com, that's T-R-O-scriptions.com, and use the code BOOMER to get yourself 10% off. Let's get on with the show with Greg McEwen, shall we? Oh, yeah. And, and uh, we, 
there's like several things we've learned, but of course, let me just choose one. Oh, you can go through a uh, few if you want. I mean, one thing, one thing is, well, I'm going to start with something that most, the easiest, most practical hack ever. Mm-hmm. And that is, uh, if somebody isn't used to working from home and having their family at home, uh, if they have young children at home and so on, that no boundary world will be really tough mm. mentally. Um, and um, we, we've had that reality for in, in our home for the last five plus years, maybe six years now, because we started homeschooling uh, our older children. We have four children and we're homeschooling one. The, our eldest daughter for one year, we thought, well, sorry, one child, one year. But it that grew into multiple children, multiple years. And so we've been dealing with this reality over a longer period of time. So I feel quite sympathetic for, you know, this masses of the world population all of a sudden instantly being in that reality involuntarily, uh, or at least, or at least it wouldn't be their, their first choice. Um, and so anyway, here's, here's, the, here's the hack, is once you've chosen some room that's where you're going to do your concentrated work. You might have to just trade that off, right, with whoever you're with, assuming there are two adults that, that, that one, okay, you're going to be doing the shift out there while I'm in here and vice versa. You've got to come up with some sort of division and separation of labor. Uh, but the hack, which I keep not getting to mm-hmm. here, is, is a, a, a white noise maker. Really? Uh, like you need a white noise maker on the ends, just hang it. You can buy twenty dollars on Amazon. Uh, it just hangs on the door handle on the inside of the of the room. It's better than any other noise, you know, protector that you can get. Uh, at least in my experience. I mean, we when we, we, we I used to have a little office outside of the home, but then we moved home. I'm glad to still have an office, but it's inside, uh, and so it means that. Uh, you know the, the internal doors are wafer thin they're not designed really to produce to, to keep sound out mm-hmm. um so we went through a whole process it was expensive and what a hassle to get uh to put a new door inside mm-hmm. and after the whole thing was done and we'd even hired people to put it up and everything it made not the slightest difference <laughs> it was this completely wasted effort so people can learn this on the cheap uh, we, we did all, we sound stripped the door. We've done all sorts of things to try and create that space for real, really concentrated uh, work. And, uh, and so in the end, it's this $20 noisemaker. Um, and I came up with it, tried it, and it is unbelievably successful. Mm-hmm. It's going right now. You can't hear it, but it's going right now. Uh, and as a result, um, as a result, n- none of the perfectly good, reasonable sound that's going on outside of it is of any consequence. Mm-hmm. You know, my children play together. That's what I want them to do. They're, 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 it's very rare that I have been in, personally interrupted by some negative sound. Uh, but this allows, this just means that I get to focus here. When I go out there, I can be focused there. Mm-hmm. It's a small thing, but I tell you what, I, in fact, in everyone I've had do this or sent it to, I've sent it to some people too, and they've tried it. I get the same feedback about it. It is you just don't believe it's going to solve things, but it's a fabulous uh, little thing. Try it. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to give it a try. I'm trying to think if I could do it with any device I have here, but I'm I mean, twenty bucks on Amazon. Why not? Uh, you can try it. You can try it with your phone. There's, there is a, there is white noise maker, uh, you know, apps on the phone, and you might try that. I I don't know that it will work as well, but you can try that. Mm-hmm. But honestly, it's twenty dollars. You do it, and it is. An eighty percent solution to something that uh, that I can't think of any other solution for. Despite mm-hmm. having tried this for quite a while. Uh, one of my mentors likes to say uh, one cent solutions for problems, and that definitely sounds like one. You, what, what was the phrase? Uh, uh, one cent solutions. So this is a twenty. One. Yeah. So one cent solution. That. What's that? What, what are other examples of one cent solutions? Uh, putting me on the spot here. So it's just you know. Something it, it could be something like okay, you have a problem with social media, or you have a problem with checking email and social media and all these things, but you need to do it. Well, okay, you can block yourself from that. That's a one cent solution because you can install some app that prevents you from doing it, and therefore it, it 
really removes 90% of that problem, right? I love the phrase one cent solution. I'm a big believer in this. Uh, we get back to it, but the idea of asymmetric reward yeah. is really the whole idea of a one cent solution. It's something that has really no uh, you know, limited downside, but unlimited upside. Exactly. So, so this is it. I'm asking people to take, make a $20 bet on, on a, a sound maker and it, they'll, it'll pay for itself the first day. People won't go back. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so this is one thing, and it, that's just a really practical thing. One other idea for positivity in the family right now is, um, uh, is we, we started years ago uh, a family uh, star chart game, mm -hmm. uh, which isn't like your parents' star chart. Like it's, it's different. And here's, here's how we do it. Uh, I mean, you get everybody together with a piece of paper and you write at the top of the piece of paper a reward, a something we all would be excited to do or to have um, if we, once we have finished the game. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, it could be under these circumstances, it could be a uh, movie marathon while, you know, eating banana splits or something, you know, something like mm -hmm. that, right? It's something something fun that everybody can get behind and is exciting to do and it doesn't have to be major underneath that you have spaces it could literally but the first one we did was literally just a basic grid where people can draw or stick stars mm -hmm. but there's no name on the star chart because uh, it's not a competition between people if anyone so if anyone wins everyone wins mm -hmm. so you get a star if you catch someone doing the right thing and so it means that when I walk out or Anna's walking around, it gives you an excuse to be looking for what somebody's doing right instead of just trying to manage what's going wrong. Mm -hmm. Sort of the final rule with the, this family star chart is that you can't take stars away. There's no downside. I mean, again, asymmetric reward. Like there's no downside to playing this game. Nobody has a reason not to play it. Mm -hmm. So... It's not a source of positivity and negativity. It's only above the line interactions. And, and we, it's become such a thing in our home, such a benefit to us that whenever something starts to feel a little negative, one of our children will say, hey, can we, can we play another star game? Mm -hmm. Can we do it? And we'll get another sheet out. We're, we're, we've, done it, we've done it many times now over many years. And we just, it's just helped to introduce this sense of catching people doing the right things. And out of that habit or norm, that culture, there are, there are lots of additional layers of positivity that you can do. Every night when we have dinner together, uh, we'll, we'll toast something, mm -hmm. right? Like, let's start with a toast. Who can we toast? We'll do uh, cheers for people. Uh, we'll go around. What went right for you? What have you done well today? What can we do? It? Let's do shout outs. Uh, one of the children had these, uh, they, they came up with these really at school and elementary school, these very unusual, fun, funny cheers that they could do. And it, it has sound and I won't do them now, but mm -hmm. it's a, you know, so located that uh, and we'll often do that so that we are really seriously celebrating successes. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I tell you, I think this is, I th you know, so this is in the second ring. It's protecting the family culture, the, the asset out there. It is so vital that people do this in this environment because when you start to have a negative culture, that it's not just, oh, that doesn't feel good for people. Is it negativity and positivity are causative? Mm-hmm. So when negative emotions come in, what happens is that people start to, um, you know, that's your options narrow and it's fight, flight, freeze. Mm -hmm. right? We all know that. And that weakens the system, weakens your culture, weakens the relationships between people. And it makes the, the whole less capable of dealing with the next challenge. Mm -hmm. the, the opposite is also true when you have positive culture, positive emotions present, it creates a sense of options for people, a sense of, oh, I can, I can do things. I, I have ways to proceed I didn't realize before. I'm willing to attempt something that, uh, that, that I might not have done before. I'm willing to negotiate. I'm willing to have counsel. I'm willing to have a conversation. I'm willing to explore together. All of this allows you to build social bonds together that can help you to 
be more prepared for the next big challenge that comes along. So there's a positive and upward and self-sustaining cycle that takes place. Mm -hmm. I love that. Uh, which I think is key as you then move into the third and final mm -hmm. area. One of the things you alluded to with the, the white noise machine, and we've been touching on it with the email and everything, boundaries. And it's one of my favorite parts of the Essentialism book. What other boundaries do you put in your life in order to help you focus on the essential? Well, there's lots of, there's lots of boundaries that we can talk about. Um, one of them, one of them I just heard about, I can't even verify the story. I was being interviewed and, um, cause I'm starting a new podcast. And so uh -huh. I'm now interviewing and being interviewed more often than I would otherwise be mm -hmm. doing. So we were talking about this with, uh, with, with one of the people I was talking to. They shared a story about, uh, about uh, Ben, uh, oh my God, I can't remember his last name now, but he's, uh, he, he trains CrossFit. Ben Bergeron mm -hmm. uh, is, uh, he basically trains the fittest people in the United Kingdom that train for the, the, world championships in, in CrossFit training and all this. It is. Well, the, the, as the story goes, he has um, boundary every night at work. He leaves at 5 p.m. no matter what. He's just chosen that upper bound. Mm -hmm. So it means that even if he's in a meeting, he will, it's 10 to 5, he sees the time, he's working on it, he'll just start packing up his things. He's not unpleasant about it. He keeps on talking and he's packing up his things and he's closing his laptop and he's, he's putting it in his bag and, and he's walking to the door and he'll carry on talking. And then right as it's five, he'll be like, okay, well, we're going to talk about this later. Nice to meet with you. And he's out. Five is the upper bound. And not have to rethink it every day. He has a bound. Ever since I heard that story, uh, it, it has helped in, inspire me to just five zip. It's over. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm writing a new book. I'm launching this new podcast. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's, there's work. Course could never be done. That third circle could fill all of time and then some. Mm -hmm. So y you never get to the point where you go and everything that could possibly be done is done. And therefore, I believe it. that's the wrong criteria. The criteria for me is like, now that I have that story as well, it's like, that's it. So I go out and I literally announce it to my family. I'm like, whatever time I'm actually out there, I will announce it. So that I go, that is the time it actually made. So if it's actually five, you feel great because that's like right there. Uh, and if it's later, if you manage to make it 5.11, I'm announcing 5.11. It, it helps to give this accountability. The principle I'm at, trying to indicate here is, is upper boundaries on work. Mm -hmm. That, that you, on anything that you're doing. Um, I was just re, reading the, the, the quite extraordinary account of Amundsen and Scott going to uh, the South Pole. Um, they had two different teams trying to be the first in recorded history to get there. Um, it's, a, it's a story that's, um, that's that shared uh, by Jim Collins in Great by Choice, but I wanted to go back and actually read the original account. Mm -hmm. And in it found a whole series of things that were fascinating. One is that Amundsen, who's the one that makes it there safely with his team, uh, successfully the first, and makes it the 6,000 miles uh, home safely with his team. Uh, it, it, this is Amundsen. First of all, he like just isn't into complaining He's just 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 takes that off the table, removes that burden and bound you know effort. But also this idea of upper bounds. His upper bound was fifteen miles a day. Mm -hmm. 15, 15 miles, fifteen miles, fifteen miles. That is what he was trying to do. When there was a when there was tempest outside, you know, when there was a snow storm, they went thirteen miles. When it was perfect conditions. Even three days before they get to the point of the South Pole, there's 45 miles remaining. 
well, it's not three days, it's just 45 miles. They have a choice. Mm -hmm. Do you do it in three days or do you go, we don't know where Scott is, this will be our chance, let's just force it, power through, and we'll be there in one day and increase our chance of being successful in this huge quest we put our lives on the line for. They, they still averaged 15 miles for the next three days, even under those circumstances. They averaged across the entire you know, months and months of this experience, 15.5 miles was their average. Wow. But it was all there that, that it, you know, averages can be, can be misleading. It's the volatility mm -hmm. were, that they were protecting against. Meanwhile, Scott's team, he complains incessantly about the bad weather. Mm -hmm. Every time there's bad weather, he writes in his journal, can you believe it? Oh, heavens, this is the, you know, my, look at the bad luck that I have. I, I, I've assumed that I would have the same weather as uh, Shackleton when he came through, but look at the terrible weather I'm having. Well, as it turns out, Shackleton's weather was slightly worse than Tom's. Mm -hmm. And Amundsen's weather and Scott's weather was exactly the same. They were coming in slightly different directions, but they, 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 they had the same 34 days into this trip, they have exactly the same ratio of good days to bad days. But Scott is constantly complaining. That complaining, we talk about negative culture and what it produced, that complaining had a, had a causative effect. What was the causative effect? On the bad weather days, they thought they had no options, so they just stayed in their tent, hunkered down, we'll see it through the bad weather and wait for a good day and then we'll go. So that was the cause of effect. It's fight, fight, or freeze. Well, we'll freeze, literally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so he stays there. On the good days, when the weather's great, they try to go max out, power out, all out effort, and exhaust them, further exacerbating the volatility of their journey. They go further and further on the good days, but they have less and less energy on the bad days. So they just stop through the bad days. As a result, they arrive way later. Uh, than, uh, than Amazon's team. So they realize that they have failed. They're exhausted as they arrive. Uh, they're depressed, of course, to find that they've failed on the way home. There's this race to beat winter because it's taken them so much longer. And eventually all five members of the team die uh, on, on the way back. I mean, it's a fascinating story. Um, and, it, and I think the whole principle of upper and lower bounds mm -hmm. is, is what's at stake here, what we can learn from it. Incredible. It Essentialism in terms of tools to get started. One of the insights that I took from the book was the kind of necessity, at least in starting, to have a journal. Is there anything else that you would recommend people to carry with them, tools you found helpful along the way? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the journal is non trivial. So let's just at least pause on that. I mean, upper, lower bound, mm -hmm. right? One sentence a day, never less than one sentence a day. And for you know, for the first however long, first months, never more than five sentences. Yeah, people normally do the exact opposite. It's a volatility approach. They write three pages day one, and day two, they don't have the time. At day three, they think they need to make up for day two. It's just totally overwhelming. They are over before they've begun. Mm -hmm. So by having an upper lower bound, you just, you get longevity. You get this for the long run. And my, my grandfather uh, I, was, I didn't know about this when I first started writing my journal, but one of my grandfathers, uh, right before he died, I was spending time with him, and he gave me a copy of, uh, of, of, a, of a book, one book, a uh, journal he'd been keeping, in which he wrote a couple of lines every two or three days for 50 years. Wow. <laughs> right? So there's one book that has this whole record of his whole life, single volume. This is within all of our influence if we keep upper and lower bounds. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, other, other things that I think are useful. I mean, I, uh, I, I, once a week to write down everything you're grateful for from that week. Mm -hmm. So I do a summary of the items in the journal from each day, each week. That is so helpful in generating positive momentum around the things that matter. Because it helps you to sense, oh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not failing at all this stuff. Look at all these good things. Let's build upon them. Mm -hmm. Rather than feeling like, oh, look at, the, look at what I lack. I mean, here's, here's, the, here's a principle I've learned recently. 
uh, it's that if you focus on what you lack, you lose what you have. Mm -hmm. And if you focus on what you have, you gain what you lack. So, and so it's, it's not just have a journal. It's what kind of journal and how do you use it? Mm -hmm. And I, you use it as a constant mechanism for reflecting on what's going right then you're much more likely to be able to make progress on the essential activities and projects that you know are important, but sometimes you just abandon and put off. Mm -hmm. So well said. Uh, last question before we get into the rapid fire. What does a day in the life of the essentialist look like right now? Um. For me, my day starts early. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just wake up when I wake up, but, you know, it's, it's before six. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, I read, um, read scriptures, uh, read wisdom literature. I get centered. Um, I don't do this every morning, but, uh, but I do it more often than I don't. So certainly upwards of 50% actually get out a huge sheet of paper. I like these 11 by 17 sheets, Sharpie, and l review what are the essential projects right now. Mm -hmm. And say, okay, what is therefore the most important work to be done today on those projects? So I, I think a projects list should be divided into those three categories I described. Uh, so protect the asset, one or two projects at any time. Mm -hmm. um, family, one, two, maxing out at three projects. And then same for, uh, for other, you know, two, three, max. So across the whole, I think the sort of the magic number for me is seven. Mm -hmm. um, and they're prioritized projects because it's inherently a prioritized uh, you know, structure. And, and, and a project can be anything, you know, I think it's like one to three months. Okay. Um, yeah, so one of my projects is to complete the next book because I've been writing it for a while and that needs to be completed by around August. Mm -hmm. So that means every day um, as I'm making my list, uh, I will look at that goal and say, okay, what's the next thing I need to do in my my rule of thumb up a boundary uh, for that task is to write two rubbish pages. <laughs> um, because absolutely everything you write starts mm -hmm. rubbish, right? Like it, you have to have the courage to be rubbish. So that would be an example, but I'm doing it through you know, the seven projects on my list. Uh, and so that means that, you know, really before I'm getting into any email or before I'm, I am, you know, or any of the other reactive things, I am looking at the essential projects list and getting myself centered for the day. It, it, in an ideal day, and it isn't always this perfect, uh, but in an ideal day, that list that I've made is effectively my done for today list. Mm -hmm. Meaning, which is a little different than a to-do list, uh, done for the day list means if I do these things, I will feel satisfied that I've done important work today. Mm -hmm. And that's the test of the list. So once you've made the list, it's looking at it and saying, okay, well, if I do those things, will I feel good about today? Or will I really just go, oh, these things over here, stressing me out and not getting to, like, what is the list that will leave you going, okay, good. Another, you know, essential day lived. Um, and, uh, and so, so anyway, that's, that's kind of the work of it. Um, you know, my, my exercise routine has been varied, uh, under these circumstances, but, uh, actually tennis is my default. Mm -hmm. I like to play, especially with my son, uh, who, um, cause when we started to hardly play, um, but he's become very, very, you know, very competitive now when we play, mm -hmm. uh, turn 14. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, I, am trying to select activities that, that, and this is all to do again with the priority projects 
order is that I want to protect my asset in a way that protects the family yeah. culture. I want to protect my fa- my personal culture, my, my personal asset and the family culture in a way that develops and protects meaningful projects outside of our home so that these things start to feed each other. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and, you know, this, it seems to be working all right. It's not everybody else's approach, but, uh, but I'm, I really am glad for this system. It's amazing. Greg, there's so many things we <clears throat> didn't get into things like play, but I want to be cognizant of your time. Final three rapid fire questions for you. What is the book that has had the most significant impact on your life? Um, again, aside from scripture, um, I would say, uh, I, mean, I think the answer I would give, but it's not really because of what's in the book. Um, you know, I, I would say seven habits. Mm-hmm. And it's not, but it's, as I say, it's not just because, okay, well, I want to be proactive or have it set, have it set and synergize. It's not, it's not because of that, although I feel like I've done my fair share of reading and thinking about those ideas. Uh, it's because, because it led me to both get to know personally, um, uh, you know, the author, Stephen Covey, but even not just that, it's not even just all oh, my association with him or his direct mentoring to me. It's, it was that very early on in my life, I sort of got a glimpse of what he was pursuing very late in his life. Mm-hmm. And that has been really game changing to, to, to see what he was aspiring to do and to be post the journey he'd gone on meant was it was a was an accelerating vision for me in my own life a sense of of how you want to impact the world and how you want to influence it so you know i think a book a book any book can be can produce a sort of mentorship relationship mm-hmm. in novels and i think that that's how that's how scripture and classic literature ought to be used is that they're mentoring us and guiding us and helping us um, but it's it's a double blessing if if you happen to be also mentored by the person behind that creative work, uh, and and that's what happened to me, and that's what I think of as being meaningful, um, in, in, in a sense of uh, what life can be and what one's mission could look like. Mm-hmm. What's your top trick, if you have one, for enhancing your focus? <laughs> yeah, do something you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess you know I'm talking to the essentialism guy, and it's it's kind of uh, maybe I'll replace this. Go ahead. No, don't replace it. Do what you want to do is a perfectly reasonable answer to that question. <laughs> don't it, when you try to do stuff you don't want to do, your focus isn't going to be very yeah. good. Do what you want to do. Figure out what's in you that's uniquely in, that, that, and I don't mean selfishly want, what's in you? What gives you a clear burning yes? Mm-hmm. Excited to get up in the morning and do it. I, writing right now, and it's not always like this, there's definitely a range for me, but writing right now every day is easy. It is a pleasure. It is, I want to do it. Uh, it's a nice sweet spot, actually, because it isn't, as I say, I can't say it's, it's always like that, but it is right now. And I think, yeah, I don't need seriously right now, as in when I say right now, I say like the last month um, for sure, I have not needed any help whatsoever with not checking news, with not checking. It doesn't matter. I don't, I don't, I don't care. I am passionate about what i'm doing i would say it's a clear yes we pulled into it passionate's not even the right word although it is true just sort of overdone Mm -hmm. you want to do this so uh so i think sometimes a focus problem is if we're just trying to do just trying to do the wrong things Mm 
<laughs> I mean, how, how there's a phrase I just came across. I love this, right? Like, can you push, can you push a boulder downhill? Mm-hmm. Right? Like, I don't want to push a boulder uphill. <laughs> we have to, right? Like, unless that's like, of course, sometimes life seems to require something like that. But what, what if I could choose a life where it is meaningful? I don't mean an easy life for the sake of mm-hmm. it. I mean, what if I could do rich, worthwhile work in an easy way? Mm-hmm. My, one of my other daughters, when she, um, she about, I think she was about 10 years old, um, had been staying up late one night brainstorming her set of conversations we'd all been having about what really matters and what's your 100 year vision of your life, all about these kinds of things. <laughs> and, uh, and she brainstormed her answers and she slipped it under our door. I don't know if I still have the sheet because it's really wild scribbles, but it was very enthusiastic and circled like, I want to be a director. That's what I want to do. And I can't believe that I've wanted that since I was like five, but just didn't know that and didn't have like the words for it. And, and here she is now. That's, she's she's uh, 17 now. Mm-hmm. She graduated high school early, like either 15 or 16. And so she's been at community college ever since. And she's doing media classes now and she's doing videos. And she's she's learned so much about this. She's done internships for, for all sorts of uh, interesting, um, you know, film projects. She's, yeah, so here she is, just turned 17. She knows more about this field than, well, certainly more than I do, uh, and, and more, I think, than the average 17-year-old because she's been able to very early figure out what it is. It's not hard work yeah. for her to go. She just did it. She, did it. she spent five hours with our other children without our super, like, over-vision, supervision, control, anything, working together for one of her video projects, recreating the... Um, the scene from um, oh, what's the movie? Uh, Princess Bride. You know Princess Bride. Oh yeah, Bride? of course. My name is Inigo Montoya. Oh, I okay powder. Yeah. I okay powder scene. <laughs> we had to recreate it a screen screenshot by screenshot. The rest of the children were the were the actors in, in each of the parts, and and it, it, it's brilliant. That's what it is. She got it's scored on fifty points out of fifty points. She got fifty. Wow. Uh, you got like yeah, hundred percent on it. And, and, uh, and five hours of this work with, we didn't do a thing. We didn't oversee it. We didn't, uh, well, what are problems and let's talk about it. And okay. Lots of conflict and contention, nothing. And this to me is like, you know, she doesn't need, she didn't need help to be focused because it's what's in it. Oh, it's beautiful. And it's a great way to leave off. Greg, where can people find out more about you? Um, well, at Gregory McEwen on Twitter or LinkedIn or, um, I guess Instagram, um, they, they can, there's a newsletter. They should certainly sign up for that. Start soon here. Uh, a, a, a new thing on that newsletter. I won't, I won't spoil it by saying what that is right now. Uh, and then the podcast, uh, essentialism podcast. Uh, and this is going to be, I mean, I am. I was thrilled about the opportunity to, to build this, uh, to be interviewing some of the most interesting people that have impacted me. But, but I'll tell you what's really exciting. The very first episode is my, with my wife, Anna. And it's like about the birth of essentialism. How did it all start? And what's, what's behind the curtain? Mm-hmm. You know, you get to learn how I got things wrong. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and I just was re-listening to that myself. And I'm not saying, oh, it was fabulous it wasn't that what i felt was this genuine sense of i need this Mm -hmm. and it got me very excited for what the point of the essentialism podcast is which is to every week have an excuse to really remember and to ask the question is this essential amazing i need it this is what will happen it'll be every week starting in june and uh, i hope people sign up and join that conversation um, I'm looking forward to it. Greg, I have to say thank you so much for the book, your time. This has been, like I alluded to earlier before we got started, a much needed conversation for me. So thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time. Appreciate that. Thank you. 
To all the superhumans listening out there, have an epic day. Wow. (laughs) Who enjoyed that episode? I know I did. Since having that conversation, I've actually pared back a number of projects. Yes, it was terrifying as hell to say no to people, but once you do it, it's very freeing. And it allows you to focus on the few projects that mean the most to you, which includes this podcast. I'm looking forward to Greg's Essentialism podcast when it comes out, but you can find all of the show notes to this one, including a link to his future show at decodingsuperhuman.com slash essentialism. 